guys. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, welcome back. Uh, what I want to do is we're going to start a new unit. Uh, we're going to start talking about animals and animals in the oceans. And so uh, the first thing I want to kind of talk about is what's an animal? So you, you guys all know what an animal is. If I say a dog or a cat or a giraffe or a shark, you know those are animals. But what makes them an animal? What what makes them an animal versus um, a, a tree? Why why is a tree not an animal? So there there are some there are some traits that animals have that make them animals. Let's talk about these different traits. Okay, the first one is animals are multicellular. They are we're, we we because we're animals too are made up of many many cells. The second thing is all of our cells have a nucleus so so because all of our cells have a nucleus we are considered eukaryotic so let me just kind of let me just kind of write this here for it so has a nucleus come on the computer's a little wonky okay um we all animals are also heterotrophs that means that we have to we have to obtain nutrients by eating we can't make our own food like a plant can that's that's what that's saying okay we have to somehow get our our energy from some other source um we we lack cell walls uh, if you look at our cells, we have a cell membrane, no cell walls. Okay, so so that's really what an animal is. Let me just back that up for a second because I want to make sure that we got it. So all animals are multicellular, eukaryotic, heterotrophic, and lack cell walls. Those are really important characteristics for animals. So there are two two loose divisions of animals they're 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 not um phyla or scientific they're just there's two major we break animals up into two major kinds so there are invertebrates and those are animals without a backbone without a spinal cord and then there are the vertebrates the vertebrates are the ones that you would probably think of as an animal so the vertebrates include the fish there's a few different kinds of fish that we'll talk about in this class. There's three different major classifications for fish, three different three different classes. Um, and then the amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. So those are the vertebrates. All the other things that we're going to talk about are invertebrates. And there's a, a whole bunch of different kinds of animals. There's about 35 different phyla or, or big characteristics big uh, um, classification schemes of animals and one of them is the is the chordates so we'll, we'll get into those a little bit later okay so I also want to talk a little bit about the the symmetry of animals because it's one of the traits that makes a particular group what they are so the first one is radial symmetry. Radial symmetry, really simply, radial symmetry is that you can cut the animal like a pie and you always have, you can, it's mirror image on either side. So if, if I cut this, this is an anemone, if I cut this anemone here straight down, right, then this side and this side are mirror images of each other. Okay? So that's called radial symmetry. Think about a radial tire or like a pizza. If I take a pizza and I cut it, this side and this side are the same, and I can cut it in a series of ways and still have both sides the same, you know, mirror images of each other. Okay, so that's radial symmetry. The other kind is bilateral symmetry. Bilateral, lateral means sides. By means two, so the two sides of an animal. This is this is um, think about this as a lobster. And if I take this lobster and I cut it down the middle like this, 
okay, you can see that this half and this half are mirror images of each other. But you can't cut it this way and have mirror images of each other. It just wouldn't work. Okay. So, so you can cut it one way and, and it's kind of like us. If I cut myself in half this way, then the two halves are mirror images of each other, right? Even, even think about your two hands, how they fit together like, like this, right? They're mirror images because they're on both sides of your body. The lobster here has both sides that are mirror images of each other if I cut it that one way, okay? And and if you look, he has, I'm going to say he, but it has a head area, it has a tail area, it has a, a middle area called a thorax. We'll, we'll get to that. This one has what's called a cephalothorax. Eh, don't worry about it. But, but if you see that if you cut it in half this way, you got two mirror images of each other. Okay. So those are going to be really, that's going to be really important when we talk about kinds of animals. So a couple of terms you should probably know. The, the tail end is called the posterior end. The head end is the anterior end. When we talk about these different organisms, these different animals that we're going to talk about throughout the rest of the course, you'll see that one of the couple of terms that we need to understand is anterior, head, posterior, tail, right? And then we also know, need to know the dorsal side is the back. So your, your back is your dorsal side. Your belly side is your ventral side. Okay? So those are some really important terms that we need to know when we talk about animals. Which leads us to the first group of animals that we're going to talk about, the periphera. So it's, I want you to, let's break, it's really helpful if you break words apart. So a pore is a hole. And if you see fera or fora, P-H-O-R-A, as, as, a, as a, a suffix, it means has, really means bearing, or has. So peripheral literally means that it has holes, okay? And you're familiar with one of the most famous ones, good old SpongeBob. And, and so... Periphera are the sponges, and, and you should know that. Periphera are the sponges, okay? Um, so periphera are a pretty neat group of animals. They're fairly simple. They're about the simplest of the animals. They're about 580 million years old. They're a pretty old group of, of animals. They were, one of, they were the first animals on scene um, that we know of, okay? So they're really, really ancient. Most of them are, are marine. So, so most of them live in the oceans or seas. There are some freshwater sponges, not a whole lot. There are actually some that live around here. Um, they're kind of small and, and um, in, indistinct. So you, you have to look for them. I have found them in, in lakes and ponds around Connecticut, um, but, but there's not very many. They were once thought to be plants because they don't move. And one of the things that when you think about an animal, you think, oh, it's got to move, right? They don't have to move. Another word for movement is modal. Let me write these terms down because you should know them. Modal means it moves. And sessile means it doesn't move. It stays where it is all the time. And there are some animals that never, ever move. Think about a barnacle. Think about coral. They don't move around. They don't crawl from place to place. Okay? So, so they're, they're considered sessile. All sponges are sessile. They don't move. Okay? Um, uh, yeah, okay. I said that. Sponges really don't have any symmetry. If you look at a sponge... You can see that it's kind of all over the place. There's no symmetry. It's not bilateral. It's not radial. It's kind of a, a, it's not symmetrical. Some of them can be 
can look symmetrical, but for we call, we consider sponges asymmetrical. Another way to say not no symmetry is asymmetrical. It's kind of important. Okay, so sponges are not symmetrical. That's really important to understand. Okay. So sponges are multicellular, heterotrophic, no cell walls, and have specialized cell types that live together. That's the definition of an animal. And so, so sponges are animals. But they're really, really simple. They don't have a mouth. They don't have a gut. They don't have like intestines. They don't have tissues. They don't have organs. It's really a collection of cells. Okay. Which is why they don't think sponges gave rise to any other animals. So, so they, they think scientists believe that sponges evolved separately from other animals. Okay. So form and function in sponges. They have a body wall that forms around a central cavity okay and they have lots and lots of holes hence porifera poor hole fera bearing has so a current of water goes through the cells from these things called collar cells and the cells that they go through are called porocytes um, a lot of them have these things called spicules that form the skeleton of a sponge let me show you what spicules look like these are spicules I took this um, at school um, these these little spiky looking things here are the spicules and so it's really inter what's interesting to note is that sponges can be identified by their spicules different sponges have different shaped spicules which is kinda neat okay but these things kinda all together make up the make up the sponges skeleton this is just a pointer in the microscope don't worry about that okay so there are these cells called amoebocytes. We'll, we'll get to these in a little bit, but they form spicules. And the spicules are made of either calcium carbonate, that's that CaCO3, or silicon dioxide, which is glass. It's, it's, it's glass, which is pretty cool. Um, there is also a group of sponges that make a skeleton out of this stuff called spongin. Spongin is, is this stuff. It's what you think of as a bath sponge. Now, the sponges that you use to clean your dishes are probably not one of these. You, you really got to get one of these at Bath and Body Works or something like that. But but this kind of sponge is made of a protein stuff called spongin. So spicules are made of either calcium carbonate or silicon dioxide. And some sponges use a protein called spongin, which is pretty cool, I think. Okay, some of them do have both. Okay, but we never have sponges that have calcium carbonate and silicon dioxide. We never have both of those together. So you can have spongin and calcium carbonate. You can have silicon dioxide or you can have silicon dioxide in spongin. Okay, but never both. So water flowing through the sponge acts as a respiratory, excretory, and internal transport system. The sp a sponge one centimeter in diameter. So so. One centimeter is about, you know, two inches, and about 10 centimeters high, can pump 22 liters of water a day through its body. That's huge. That's 11 two-liter bottles from a little thing about the size of my finger. Okay? It's pretty neat. It's a lot of water. For reproduction, water carries the sperm away. Collar cells, uh, we'll get to these collar cells, of another sponge, pick them up. Carry the amoebocytes carry them to the to the egg for fertilization and then they make they make baby sponges that go off into the water column, settle down and become an adult sponge. They can also reproduce asexually. Um, they can they they can bud and there's some other things that we're not going to get into, but they they can also reproduce asexually, which means just one plant just one plant just one sponge can make other sponges. Okay. So let's get into this sponge anatomy. Um, and, and so what I want to do is, in your notes, I'd like you to write down the letter of the structure that I give you in the, in the table uh, on your notes. Okay, so here we go. 
here is a stereotypical sponge with the with the body wall and then an internal cavity okay so let's take these one at a time and we'll write down the letters in your table but I want you to understand. So spicules are these needle-like structures. Spicules are letter F. So if you find letter F here, um, and I think there might be another, yeah, this this is F here, right? Uh, so F. Um, collar cells are these special cells that have what they call a collar. They're called coanocytes. Let me draw kind of a bigger one for you. So, so collar cells look like look like a normal cell. They have a nucleus and they have all the parts that you would think of as a as a cell, right? Endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria, you know, all those things, right? But but they have a collar. It's made up of these pieces and there's a flagellum that comes out and this flagella, flagellum, beats. And when the flagellum beats, it moves water in the sponge. Now, if it's locked in position and it's moving water, it's going to push water up this way. So water has to come in through these holes in these cells. Okay? And so that's what a collar cell does. Uh, let me. Or a coanocyte. The water comes in through. Oh, I'm sorry, let me back this up a little bit. Collar cells are letter G. So if you find G, here's G, it's pointing to this thing here, that's a collar cell. Okay? All right. Uh, moving along. The pore cells or porocyte, oops, porocytes, letter C, um, are the cells that have holes in them that the water flows through. Okay, so water's going to flow, oops, water's going to flow. Uh, let me do it in black. Water's gonna. F I'll do it in green. Water's gonna flow through these porocytes or pore cells. Okay, I'll color them in green. You know what? Let's let's color some things here. So I'll make the spicules red. So these things are the spicules okay and they line this big opening at the top we'll get to in a couple minutes and the collar cells will color let's color them blue what the heck the collar cells are blue so all these things are collar cells or coanocytes You get the idea. Okay. Um, so, amoebocytes are pretty cool things. I'm going to color them. Let's see, what color can I color? Let's color them yellow. Amoebocytes are these little amoeba like critters. Oops, sorry. These little amoeba-like critters, I'll color them yellow. All these guys here are amoebocytes. And what they do is, they, they actually do s several jobs in the sponge. Amoebocytes are letter E, so you want to write down your letter E there. Um, and amoebocytes do a couple of things. Well, a few things. They crawl through the sponge and they make spicules. They carry material throughout the sponge, so food 
and and we already talked about sperm throughout the sponge okay and one of the really cool things is amoeba sites are kind of the stem cells of a sponge they can turn into any other cell that the sponge needs as it's going along as it's, it's at, throughout its life once it turns into that cell it's locked as that cell but the amoeba sites can become any cell in the sponge that the sponge needs pretty cool okay the other cells that we need to know about let me pick up a new color we'll color them brown I guess the the other cells that that the sponge need that we need to talk about are these cells that line the outside of the sponge these cells all along the edge here and, and these these are the same cells right these are called epidermal cells. Your epidermis is your skin, right? So this is the skin of the cell, of the sponge. Okay? All of these. And the epidermal cells are letter B. So you want to write on you want to write for epidermal cells, you want to write B. Okay? So they form the, pretty much the skin of the cell of the sponge. Okay. Last but not least, is this large opening at the top of the of the sponge that the hole if you look at at this one here you can see this this is the hole in the top right that's called the osculum the osculum is letter j okay and so this area here oh, oh, oh sorry my bad this area let me see if i can pick up a different color this area i'll call it i'll call it this area here this hole is the osculum. That's where the water comes out. Okay, so let's talk just for a couple of seconds about a, how a sponge eats. Okay. Oop. Oh, did it again. So a sponge, in order for a sponge, it, remember it's heterotrophic, so it has to eat. What a sponge does is it the flagella on the coanocytes beats. It causes a water. I'm gonna I'm gonna do it in blue. So as the coanocytes beat their flagellum, their flagella, water. Ah, sorry. Do it like that. Okay. I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger. So as the coanocytes beat, water moves through the porocytes into the sponge the food particles get trapped in the collar let me maybe make these a little bigger get trapped in the collars of the coanocytes and so these little black dots will be food particles. The food particles get trapped in the collars of the coanocytes. If the coanocyte needs the nutrition, it will eat. It'll, it'll absorb those food particles. If it doesn't, it gives it to the amoebocyte. If the amoebocyte needs the food, it eats. If it doesn't, it will carry it to the other cells within the sponge. And that's how all of the cells in the sponge get nutrition. So... That's it for sponges, for periphera. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, come on. I appreciate it. Um, you guys have a great day. Thank you very much.